and one of the reasons why I do want to start now um, is because uh, I want us to um, leave an adequate amount of time at the end uh, for questions. Um, it's just that rather than have them posed to each speaker afterwards, it seemed more sensible to try and create a, a block of time at the end. Uh, so, can people... Okay, um, let's start then. I'd like to introduce Herma Fashadi, who's going to speak, um, whose paper is entitled The Slow Tactility of History, um, Rachel White Reed's Holocaust Memorials, amongst others. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, when um, I was asked to talk about uh, the work of Rachel Whiteread on the occasion of her exhibition at the ICA in Philadelphia and Boston about two years ago, I took on the task knowing that my contribution from the point of an architect was taken for granted. I was interested to relate the working of these objects to that of so-called architectural things, both before and after the literal building. In analyzing their work as both the trace and the actual things, I called these objects sightless monuments Two operations were at work, as I saw them. One having to do with the mimetic doubling at work in them, their alterity vis-a-vis -vis the original object, conditions of their one-to-one -one scale, material transformation and translations, and spatial negative, contributed to this doubling. The other had to do with a particular kind of history that they recollected. Material traces of past use, what we uh, in architectural terms call program, performative stoppages of any potential for use that they would uh, refuse to be usable as we would uh, know them in the architectural practice altogether and um, a new situation of their viewing in the city gallery, a certain kind of back and forthing between uh, where they might be understood as belonging in the gallery city exchange. Um, or finally, erasure of the original sites contributed to positing this sense of an arrested time and production of a new tactile history in the object. Um, it was in this sense that I called uh, the talk this time, this time round, uh, the slow tactility of history. In a sense, a new kind of memory, uh, which Rachel Whiteread was asked to produce, um, having been, uh, for the first time, commissioned to do a project. That is uh, a point where the, the actual uh, impetus for the work was a program that was given to her by a, an agent outside of her own uh, choosing and the origin of the object uh, had come uh, as a program from outside. Um, so the, the original senses of uh, the doublings in the, city, in the objects that uh, were her other work up to now involved uh, was uh, now having to be questioned uh, differently. This was before the occasion of her Holocaust Memorial, where an actual commission to produce a monument was the impetus for the work. To re-examine this analysis at this time, vis-a-vis -vis the project of the Holocaust Memorial, puts interesting uh, problems forward, which I'd like to at attempt to address. Ideas produce images, we are told, by ancient wisdom, 
An architect, according to Aquinas, first has the idea of a house, then he builds it. God supposedly made the world in similar fashion. Aquinas' architect still haunts us. He imagines, then he draws. Robin Evans, um, however, who I'm sure is uh, known to many of us here, however, has suggested otherwise. Imagining with the eyes closed, as if the whole world were held in, in the mind, is an impossible solipsism, he says. The imagination works with eyes open. It alters and is altered by what is seen. The problem is that if we admit this, then the relation between ideas and things turn mutable and inconstant. Such destabilization is bound to affect our understanding of architectural drawing, which occupies the most uncertain uh, negotiable position of all along the main thoroughfare between ideas and things, he suggested. This was a productive and an eye-opening analysis on the function of the drawing in the process of imagining a thing, a building, for instance. Um, bearing this instability in mind, confronted with Rachel Whiteread's things, I'm tempted to go backwards, that is, from the thing back to the drawing, um, and to the drawing as opposed to the idea of the drawing, to look at how these specific things, Rachel Whiteread's objects, whether a mattress, the room, or the house, or now the memorial building thing, draw. This, I mean it in the most literal sense. Uh, I'm trying to bring the, the notice to how the, the, the thing itself is drawing. As architectural drawings do, in the same way, the, ori the original object. I have in mind the work of a specific convention of drawing, that of the plan, the orthographic register of buildings made before construction for the project or after construction as a means of surveying. But these works are three-dimensional things, one might say, made up of physical stuff, material, and occupy space in ways which um, architectural plans do not, at least not literally. However much the perceptual condition of these two things may differ, what in my view is shared between these categories of work is in the way they operate in representation. While I would use the technique and construct of architectural plans or orthographic projections to suggest an operational analogy with the work of White Reed. However, I am well aware of the limits of such an analogy and in fact would emphasize the importance of their distinct differences and would argue against its quick equation with its ascription as architecture or any other combinatory term, sculpture, etc. It would be to these differences that I shall refer in order to describe a set of argumentational knots and I, and I mean that um, in, a inverse, in inverse commas, logical hiccups and doubles, which I believe the work of uh, Rachel Whiteread constructs. These knots, knots rather, I believe are structural logics through which the work achieves a critical slowness. Um, and here I'm going to go through um, the six instances of these knots, what I have called knots, the doublings. The first one is the plan thing, um, which puts cognitive representation against uh, visual representation. And one is not um, trying to uh, determine which one it does, but how these two uh, set up an exchange in the work. Ignographia, or literal footprints, are what plans were called by the Renaissance artists, geometers. 
as a graph of what the foot registers on the ground. The plan describes the pacing which the foot traces in actuality as opposed to the picture as seen by the eye. The perceptual picture would use perspective, the plan, orthographic projection in general, as a cognitive construct would carry the literal measure and proportion in parallel projection lines. And of course, you know, as architects, you would know, know this uh, as a matter of fact, as a convention. While the plan as a picture does not look like the thing it draws, it carries the relational properties of the object it traces with fidelity to measure an outline of form. It would be impossible to literally see the exact plan of a place other than with the mind's eye, so to speak. One could speak about the plan in the way it maps the knowledge of place or a thing. The reader of the plan would construct the experience, however, through his or her own memory and capacity for bodily imagination. This is a slow operation of pacing in one's mind corporeally. This is um, just to note the, the modes in which this, uh, the plan of uh, relationship of different uh, um, parallel projections, uh, orthographic projections, were set up by the two axes where um, the plan, the elevation, and the side view were related by carrying parallel lines on the three uh, qu quarters of the axes. And of course, uh, Dürer's sections through the body where the, the descriptions of the map of the, the head or the body were not to uh, picture the head, but would construct the, the figure of the head, the space of the head, by, uh, by its consecutive sectional cuts. In the work of Rachel Whiteread, the primary form in the construction of the thing comes from elsewhere. Like plants, these various objects trace and pace other objects. The work has no origin other than in what we already know use and are familiar with in everyday life. Like plants, these objects do not merely copy, but scale, measure, and at once recognize and defamiliarize by demonstrating known, uh, unknown relationship, relationships within it. An object which we know perceptually is acted out concretely through a cognitive map this time in its estranged conditions, as a plan of a thing would never look like anything you know of the thing from outside or unless you go through it, walk it. A doubling, a doubling with scalar exactitude. The elevation which used to have windows and doors, and this is in Rachel Whitery's work, roof, etc., with material differences, you know, wood, masonry, uh, concrete, etc., would now, in her work, be simply a series of incisions on a uniform surface, barely reminding us of their original function and material, yet exactly tracing where things were, how they were near, perhaps too near for us to remember. And this nearness, of course, is that bodily uh, nearness. An object which is known to us in its use, in haptic experience, stands in solitude of its own negative form and uh, unaccommodating, impenetrable solid solidity. The pacing of the compressed surface will construct a cognitive elevation, another orthographic projection, out of the facade, which is a certain face that, as we might recognize in seeing, um, one would usually see in perceptual perspective. This knot of alterity is in, fa in effect made up of three uh, uh, operations in her work. One is the material translation, that is when the work which used to be made up of various uh, different uh, materials, say in the house or in the bed, a mattress, etc., 
bathtub would now be, become uh, all uh, cast in plaster, resin, uh, or other mater uh, singular materials. Second is the spatial negative of the inside out interior, the casting um, of the negative. And in, and in a scale which is commensurate with our bodies in one-to-one -one relationship. It's very important uh, that in architecture we all, we're always making models and we are casting models. Uh, so for us to see things in a, in a way that we can see them uh, as small objects uh, gives it a different status uh, than when the thing becomes the same scale as what is supposed to accommodate our body. Therefore, there is a, a distinctly uh, jarring uh, operation that happens when the one-to-one -one scale uh, puts the object uh, in our face, so to speak. The negative space of architectural poche. In this case, this is uh, the second knot, um, which is where the interiority of the section is um, posited. Now, I, I wanted to use a, um, oops, now I have to go back. Um, this is a um, slide which I'm using in the in the lieu of uh, what uh, Kircher I have used before of Kircher's wall and ears drawing. Um, in his, he was um, putting a section of a wall with which of a, was of a series of spaces connected with a, a huge uh, amount of sectional poche in between them. In these cases, uh, the drawings are um, of the mining operations uh, from Diderot's encyclopedia uh, for the crafts where he's describing the work of the miners, mining sections of the mines. And again, as a certain kind of uh, section of earth where this digging happens, the negative that is constructed is shown through the section and the space between the sections inhabited section becomes unknown to the process of inhabitation, to the plan of what, where we might be um, living or what, we might be, what might be known to us. Um, the, in Kircher's walls and ears to point to a consciousness which belongs to that which buildings materialize for us. The space of the wall, or more accurately, that, that what constructs this space of the room on two different sides of the wall, which is when a poche, when a wall has two different outlines and describes two different faces of two different spaces, one behind the other. Essentially, a wall with two different contours is the subject of the play. The world perceived by inhabitants as within is constructed against the body which is unknown to the inhabitant and is revealed through the section. By containing viewing devices and sound amplifiers, the secret of event of each room is revealed to others unbeknownst to them. The architectural poche uh, wall is what allows the world to have two different faces and the intermediate seems to be out of our consciousness as a kind of regulator, an invisible master, or an infrastructural enabler. Rachel Whitery's materials seep through the cracks of walls in the spaces of the poche. What she embodies are actually these poche spaces. And around and under the installations, the bathtub, the desk, the table, and, the fi and finds the hidden spaces pocheted between and surrounding things of the house. These most familiar objects find their literal spatial doubles in what Kircher ascribed to them through their borrowed eyes and ears. The logic of construction of R. W., uh, Rachel Whitery's house starts from the construction of a negative space. It's the cast as the negative space. Though 
what I'd like to say is that it's not completely, it's theoretically not complete, and um, by definition so. With slightly longer attention, it becomes clear that this house or the ghost only begin by their casting of the negative space. Architecturally, the pochette space need to be supported, needs to be supported by positive beams and fillers, which are only assigned their role as negative. The literal need for bearing of the load between the two floors of plaster solids point to the contradictory function of this object as a house, which only signifies signification when in material and not in theory or in words, still requires positive literal support. Here, the world between the bearer of memory and that of the physical world merge and intersect. The conflict makes the rule of the negative game blurred and perhaps more interestingly entangled. The abstract logic of the negative space has to negotiate through positive material weight and dimensional requirements. Computer negatives, hovering solids held up by air would be the tr true theoretical negative. Yet this thing sits on the ground as if um, the original house was there. I'm referring to the project of the particular house that uh, Rachel White Reed cast. The relationship to ground cannot be solely theoretical, and it becomes tectonic. So the, the intersection of uh, the, the tectonics and the theor theoretical uh, is uh, uh, double the, the knot in this instance. In the Holocaust Memorial, and uh, Rebecca went through the description very um, carefully, uh, which was very interesting for me to hear, um, has the same problem. In the Holocaust Memorial, this condition of the theoretical negative space has been achieved with the sighting of the solid on the glass ground. Perhaps a more accurate, if less conflictual, condition of the relationship of the thing, both to itself and to the site. Um, I believe this uh, sliding is um, something that uh, perhaps erases that, that problematic, which I'm um, suggesting that is held in the other work of Rachel Whitery. The transference of the object from another site is more articulated in this instance. The memorial inscription on the glass to remind one of the more threatened and precarious presence, especially in the context of the contemporary city with its buried history and excavations. The fact that we know that this is a plateau made um, and it's gl glazed and therefore uh, reflective, it's, it's a certain kind of slippage of grounding, it's a certain uh, kind of refusal to ground is operative, as I understand it, uh, but also in a more literal way the fact that um, the synagogue buried there is uh, not made present becomes a, a uh, uh, discussion that the city has to now uh, reconcile with this work. Uh, so there is a two, la two ways where the history is operative. One, the literal history of the city as buried in, uh, at the base, and the two, the history of this displacement of the object from a site as though elsewhere. The other objects of, the, of White Reed were all found in the city and then they were transported to where might have been a gallery or a museum. Whereas now this is designed, so to speak, uh, for the site and yet its displacement, its transportation to that is made uh, distinct by this uh, slippage of the base and the, and the transparency of the glass. Um, I'm not sure whether she means to have uh, this base work as only uh, a visual construct or is there any possibility of it to be stepped on or in what way it becomes really part of the experience of the library. It's a very interesting problem to me that, uh, that that's um, to be decided or that maybe she has some ideas that I'm not aware of. But in any case, it makes uh, one of the problems of the new library, the, this kind of grounding.
problematic. Another knot is the catching of the scratches, I call it, materials and their double function, trace and erase. The materials of um, Rachel Whitery's objects have a double function. One, they solidify and fill out and erase. Second, they trace and bear history. Traces of life and use. When architecturally one material takes the place of another, the tectonics is erased. What used to be uh, wood, uh, concrete, etc., becomes all plaster, resin, or other uh, rubber. The new tectonics, um, there, or new tectonics operate. This muting of tectonic appearance accentuated the surface um, trace of history, not of the object's own life, but of the life that it received. As a receptor, it maps out incidental scratches and marks, as well as traces of functional handles and knobs compressed as the same. This was in the case of the room or the house uh, where specific uh, light switches or sp specific scratches were, would become part of the same uh, material, the plaster that would only make, uh, refer to them as by incisions. Function and memory merge, whereas in the architectural monuments, layers of materials differentiate and accumulate in the object, they are compressed as the same. The representation of history is slowed down through the material transference and delayed re recognition of compressed marks. In the Holocaust Memorial, I'm not aware of how this distinction between these two modes of operation of the material may work, how literal the books and their arrangement may go between their generality as general category of book, as books, to the specificity of their particular history. The typicality may be the question here. And again, I think the uh, discussions that uh, Rebecca pointed to are quite interesting um, and quite acute in the way that they're talking about the potential of a book to uh, the, the object of a book without its uh, specific, uh, the knowledge of its subject matter to become its uh, index, uh, to work as an index. Um, however, I think in the, uh, this is a very important distinction between the work uh, that she did before this memorial and this one where we, we would have these objects which were particular in the, in the life they carried and in the inscription of that li life, the trace of that life, uh, when they were cast, as opposed to when uh, the assignation of the symbolic role is given by the author through a, uh, a uh, what, w what she has called the symbolic book. It's um, her, her choice of which books and the arrangements, etc. Um, and finally, the question of sighting becomes again important. The objects and their sighting as sculptural works versus buildings on their lots. Traveling between site installations and galleries or museums, these objects take on a value. Um, as cultural objects, differing from architecture. Uh, architecture insofar as it has uh, distracted meaning, uh, meaning for a distracted user. This work uh, is spatial and in, in the one-to-one -one scale related to the inhabitable. Opacity, which in my view the work strives to achieve, uh, that, that is to describe, with and despite orthographic precision, that destabilized representation of the negative, which is never complete, and by virtue of which a fluidity between the imagined object and the actual one is prompted, while it registers and projects at the same time through a contradictory logic. In its failure to be total and singular, um, this is um, perhaps more similar to the abstractions that uh, are used as cast, 
um, it becomes a site for the object, subject of a history which is to be unraveled in a slow pace in silence and through its tactility. Here, the history is not uh, one where the narrative is to be explicit, but in fact is a certain muting of that narrativity. Here, history is not only what has been, but out of now and what will be. It is recognized as a form, a body, which inscribes life as it happens. In architectural representation, this happens with the drawings with the history that surveys drawings, uh, survey drawings construct, or orthographic construction drawings project, when we um, have to prepare uh, a building before um, it's built on the drawing board, or when we have a building, um, Roman ruins or any other building, and we need to now draw it up in survey. It, re it resides in a domain before and perhaps after architecture, uh, strictly speaking architecture. The temporality of this zone is a crucial part of its condition. In the Holocaust Memorial, such a time is perhaps assumed in relation to the city. The city's encounter with it would be a history to be acted out. That, um, that there is such an ideality um, imposed on the, on the work is what is always in front of my mind uh, in relation to how cities construct monuments in time. So the monument um, as described by, uh, as achieved through the city, I am putting against the memorial where the ascription of an object as memorial stops the time at a, at, at a certain point in time is asserted. I would contend that the political power of the house had ensued probably from such direct relationship to the history of the original artifact as a typical row house of that street. Its site and its deportation from its original place became part of a narrative of objects which were to be exhibited as if in the gallery or the museum. In summary, in the context of the Holocaust Memorial, Two aspects of the work bring up questions. One has to do with her work in the process of production signification, the way these doublings um, are constructed, um, its uh, mimetic alterity, and the other has to do with the new situation of the work as a new work on a new site, as it were, from the gallery to the city. It used to be that the work of Rachel Whitery came from the debris of city life and via her work found their way into the gallery and museums. Even when the work was not to be literally, um, literally there, such as work described as window display or the house, the displacement was part of the operation. Their homelessness assumed this home missing, a site to which it once belonged, making them strangers where they were supposed to belong. From a house, um, Rachel Whitery's Holocaust Memorial is a designed and sought thing. As such, its reference to life behind it is decidedly symbolic, where her objects caught history off guard. Her, here she addresses it from its center through its, uh, through its established reference, calling the book, the people of the book, and the library as the symbolic. Um, reference. The representational structure of the construct still holds all the tangles and therefore allows for a more problematic acting out of history than a symbolic structure of commissioned memorial would otherwise achieve. The reference to its cognitive construct as plans, as I've called them, is intersected by invitations to travel and remember otherwise through inscription and through the idea of the book, of books. The literal content is left behind for the prevalence of the idea of the library, not a specific set of books or library. Whereas in her other work, the force of their history was found with them. Here it is to be projected, much as the plan allows us to do in a project to describe a history with a body. Now, 
um, some instances of, the, of her work where this uh, simultaneous <laughs> presence of both the negative uh, cast and what I've called the tectonic uh, necessity for bearing weight and uh, physical matter uh, coincide and what makes it uh, to be this, uh, co this knotted construct, the beams and the uh, siting of the house. Oops. This is an example of a traditional casting which would, were used for monuments and other uh, industrial casts. The, the unity which the fin final material was to produce was ensured by the way these, the tectonic uh, tissue was constructed around and the filling out was supposed to finally uh, give a total object this total object which would stand as the, the uh, monument, monument in the sense of a totality of an object, whereas the, and I, call, and I call this a memorial in the sense that it is ascribed in its meaning, its reference, with, with, the, with White Reed's objects, this kind of um, cutting the time of this ascription by holding what is supposed to be part of the uh, process of casting negativity and that which constructs it, that which holds it up tectonically, uh, the two are put one against the other. The example of uh, before and after history is interesting to me here where the instances where buildings are delaminated or demolished or held up after uh, to keep from falling apart. Uh, this kind of arresting of time is what I believe is going on here in the way that cities and landscapes hold a, a certain notion of history. And in the construction of the work, the, the way in which the casting frame of before and after of her in the process of production of the work become useful um, instances of the, of the objects, um, representational devices. This, this idea where the object is uh, trying to set itself up, um, and th this is always a wish, a certain kind of horizon of expectation that is projected as a negativity which is always uh, in contradistinction to its own weight. Therefore, this impossible uh, ideational uh, perfection, uh, which uses abstract uh, elements to show where it's supposed to be read as void, as weightless, versus full of weight or solidity. And the instance of an actual history arrested by its uh, peeling off or using of the marble elsewhere, which gives a, the artifact of actual history a certain arrested time in our, in our cities. Whoops, that's an upside down. The, again, um, Rebecca mentioned this. Uh, it's very interesting to me the way that the choices are made in the cuts that are uh, uh, introduced in the casting and become quite crucial uh, renderings of what is otherwise a volumetric, a negative volumetric. So on the one hand, we have a negative volumetric of what is supposed to be the base of a tub. And on the other hand, we have these uh, very distinct lines or pieces of cast uh, of resin, I believe, here, which uh, starts to bring the, the memory of what is the material trying, uh, how the material is holding itself up, the size, the, the dimensional limits of each um, the size of casting and the way in which um, holes and, and pieces are introduced. And again, the, this same idea 
uh, that uh, the way in which a literal cast is used here is, uh, and Rebecca went that, through that quite uh, um, in precision, how the literal cast is now then turned into, oops, do we have the other one? Yeah, the, the, the way the literal cast is set against this uh, uh, cast with a uh, positive uh, um, uh, construct to it. I, I can't help <laughs> but, uh, but, but look at this as a cube and say, uh, how is it that uh, she decided to make it uh, such a perfect uh, symmetrical cube with uh, particular positions for the doors and for the uh, paneling and for the symmetrical subdivisions. There is a certain uh, um, centrality, there's a certain kind of positive inscription that is coming here, which really, to me, is uh, negating what, in her previous work, uh, the work of uh, the life of the object took care of. Here, uh, it is being constructed according to an ideal uh, notion of geometry, a notion of uh, perhaps even propriety. And in that sense, it becomes symbolically decided by the author versus the certain um, arrest of what is the monument um, in at least uh, what uh, Rossi would describe as the work of the monument in the city. Um, so mm, I, I find this uh, uh, perhaps is getting closer, uh, where I, whereas I would have called these others uh, the sightless monuments, I, I would probably call the, uh, find that this is uh, approaching more to be the memorial, memorial in, in the sense that it's ascribing its own um, symbolic uh, roles. Um, and finally, I, the two, uh, the two uh, different modes with which we uh, uh, deal with uh, historic uh, symbolization, uh, one, that of the city in the city market and halls in Padova, which has the layers in, and, and is described in its plan of various stages of its life. From, you know, the black is the 17th century uh, piece of the uh, building and the various added uh, 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 various added pieces of the building which were built after the fire and its drawing before the fire and the project above, this kind of sense of uh, accretion of life that the building accumulates uh, and makes it a monument in the city, uh, uh, an architectural uh, a monument which has a certain um, life and role in the now as much as it has uh, in the past, it has had in the past, uh, as opposed to the memorial which uh, tries to produce a, uh, let's say, perfect cipher for symbolic uh, reference, as a symbolic reference. reference. That's it, thank you. What I want to say, which I'm entitling Inside Outcast, um, is really about the relationship uh, between Rachel Whitebread's uh, work and the, the strange kind of ambiguity between kind of mourning um, and memory. Uh, I shan't end, uh, in a sense, with a conclusion, um, but with a set of questions. 
One object of fascination for visitors to Pompeii in the early 19th century um, was a fragment of scorched earth, which was kept in the museum at Portici. It bore the imprint of a young woman's breast. It also seemed to demand of generations of visitors that they too record their impressions. Chateaubriand wrote there, death like a sculptor has molded his victim. But the meaning of the sentence seems in some way unclear. How does death sculpt? It's certainly not by carving. If the sentence means that death covers the victim with an impressionable shroud, then does this make death a sculptor or the maker of casts? Now, the status of the fragment, the nature of the impression, and the legibility of the trace are all combined here in a way which introduces a kind of dizzy confusion into the normal discussions of sculpture and mimesis. For the fragment of earth was not being used to reconstitute a model of the original breast, but remained in its enigmatic trace, uh, enigmatic role as a trace. It was not part of the skeleton. It was not a mummified body. It was what Anthony Vidler in the Architectural Uncanny called the ghost of a breast. But that doesn't resolve the question, what is a ghost? The impression, the cast, the trace of the breast, all refer to the breast, but they do not do so by any relation of mimetic representation. Rather, the breast is referred to through the medium of the trace, that is, of casting. There is no representation of a breast, still less is there a, a symbol or a sign for a breast. It signifies, as it signifies, it signifies through the negative dimension of what is not there. It refers to the breast as an absent object, which, if it returned, would fit this impress. This shape, then, can be thought of from the point of view of the absent breast as a negative, present but negative. It refers to an object which is positive but absent. This negative, this cast, remembers the object which has gone, which has been lost. But again, what is a ghost? And why is this impress a ghost? <coughs> the ghost is, as it were, a trace of representation which lacks the means to come into existence. To represent, it would need some of our warmth some of our life. That is indeed what it means to be haunted. The ghost, the trace, uses our positive existence to tell its tale or to outline the object. Indeed, if a ghost touches us, it robs us of heat and we become less than ourselves. But unless we allow this to happen, we will not be able to remember the breast whose ghost confronted Chateaubriand. It is not surprising that it is here in an economy whose terms are memory, loss, and the negative that the usual discussions about representation and mimesis are, as it were, derailed. Now, of course, there is a way of foreclosing and kind of denying uh, all these difficulties. Instead of regarding the trace as an object, I can just regard it as an element of production. I can cast replicas of the object from it. Now, of course, all attention transfers to the technical and representational issues of how like the breast is this cast of the breast. The gap between them is reduced to the idea of a process. Far from being a ghost of a breast, the trace becomes no more than the condition of the reproduction of casts of the breast. The trace, the impress, is their dimension, and the negative world, which is their dimension, 
are all repressed by the everyday mechanics of casting. But they return wherever loss and remembering are at stake. Clearly, this is the world within which the works of Rachel White Reed operate. The critics' consistent references to issues of memory should not be thought, I think, as a kind of critical imposition upon the work, nor even a consequence uh, of the apparent subject of the work, such as House, but a rather a strict consequence of the material means through which she works. That is, it is part of the logic of traces. Over time, the works of Rachel Whiteread have specialized from objects to objects that contain objects, that is, from mattresses, tables, cupboards, basins, to the series that runs from the wardrobe to the room and finally to house. This movement from an object to an object that contains space allows for a clarification in the trajectory of her work. Casting the trace of the object continues, but this becomes combined with a materialization of the space with which the object contained. In 1988, she produced Closet, the space of the interior of a wardrobe. In 1990, uh, Ghost was exhibited. It consists of casts of the interior of a room, which manifests itself as a solid cube upon which are impressed the exterior details of an interior. I say, uh, I say that deliberately, the exterior details of an interior, because frequently the effects of her work are described as inside out, or reverse, reversed. Now these terms, in fact, are too loose, but they do testify to an odd fact. They testify to the fact that it is extremely difficult to read the resulting constructions. It is as if perception wants to travel in the opposite direction from the intellectual knowledge we have of what is being represented, of what is being cast. Perceptually, it's as if we demand to read the object as the exterior of a solid construction. And indeed, on such a reading, it has the conventional aspect of an exterior surface, and by implication, of an interior. It is only when perception is directed to the details of the cast, made by the interior of the room, the fire, the windows. It's only then that uncertainty sets in. Suddenly, perception, as it were, loses its footing, and it becomes possible to begin the more arduous reading of the object as the interior space and the cast as the outside of the inside, the outside of the inside of the room. The surface of what had appeared as the exterior of the construction now glimly dimmers as the registration of the moment of the division between the object and the space on the inside of the original object. This is indeed the ghost of a room. For what is characteristic of ghosts is not that they're seen or not seen but that they transform the relation between what is normally seen and what is normally not seen. House, in a way, goes a stage further. The object which contains space is moved out from the last sheltering object which also contains space, that is, the gallery. House is, or was, is, was, in the world. And, of course, the world beat a path to inquire what its place was in the world. Suddenly, its import was judged in an architectural and urban context and was constantly interrogated as to what its appearance and its disappearance might mean. At a critical level, then, 
there seemed to be an uncommon unity to the terms through which house was discussed. The uncanny, memory, monumentality, together with loss and mourning. These all in, in one way or another uh, were spread across many accounts of the project. The success of the project, that House emerged fully determined by its technique and its objective, also meant that the degree to which it was delayed with questions and demands, in all this, it maintained a sibylline muteness. It remained, until its destruction, a monumental presence, a monument to what wasn't there. The terms of the uncanny seemed particularly appropriate, especially since the German terms heimlich and umheimlich start precisely from the place of the house. <coughs> Freud, in his essay on the uncanny in 1919, defined it as that class of the frightening which leads back to that which is known of old and long familiar. The uncanny seems to be that which is strange and out of place, but recalls it as being in the register of what has always already been there, but forgotten or repressed. This definition may be taken together with Schelling's definition that the meaning of the uncanny is something that ought to have remained secret, but which has come to light. The materialization of the space and the cast of the outside of the inside, as I wish to insist that it is, of the house, exposes as visible that which had been the unthought, the unthought of part of the house, at least from the point of view of the exterior. That is what lends house the character of inside out, though this is not strictly what the casting performs. The secrets of the house seem to be revealed through the opposite of their existence in a monumental solidity. The familiarity of the domestic space has been cast in the utterly strange mode of a construction. The negative has been given positive volume and our perception of the event has to struggle to master what has happened. But I think more importantly, house could also be experienced in terms of melancholy and particularly in terms of mourning. Not only for the home which had been lost, but for an urban life whose community had, over the lifetime of the house, endured many losses. This is perhaps more than just an associative remark about house, for indeed I think it reflects the very nature of Rachel Whiteread's casting and her practice. You may recall that in Freud's essay on mourning and melancholia, the subject replies to, reacts to the death of a loved object. And in the outpouring of his or her grief, the subject labors to keep the loved object alive. That is to say, the first reaction to death is to, to insist, however manically, uh, that the death has not occurred, that the object lives. A period of mental anguish is then born, whose objective is, is as impossible as it is painful. To keep the loved object alive, the subject identifies with the loved object. This process of identification, of identification with the dead loved object in order that that object be kept alive, is extremely difficult to describe. One way of thinking about it, which Freud does in his essay, is to say, that whatever the loved object loved, suddenly the subject, suddenly I love it, or I identify with it. 
Carl Abraham has a particularly poignant account of a son uh, mourning the sudden death of his father who, within the space of a few days, takes on the white hair of his father. And Abraham insists this is not to be thought of uh, kind of biolog uh, biologically as some speeded up process uh, of aging, uh, but the, 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 the literal, the deepest somatic identification uh, with the loved object. It's a process of identification in which one takes on the object, in which one is suddenly molded by the object. Now, certainly this identification of the subject with the loved dead object is not a question of kind of, of, of mimesis. It, it, is not a, it is not an imitation of the dead lost object. It is not one in which the subject becomes the simulacrum of the object. My wish, as it were, my wish to, to keep you alive by becoming you is not a question of becoming only like you. I cannot become only like you because, of course, I remain myself. It is rather that I will be the substance which takes you on in your absence. Perhaps we might say that I am molded by your absence so that I become your imprint, so that I become your trace. Perhaps in this way of, of considering Freud's account of the act of mourning, uh, one can make more than just an association. Perhaps here we can make an, a strict analogy with Rachel Whiteread's technique of casting, a strict analog for the obscure process of identification which operates in mourning. It's almost as if when I am turned out in grief, I do not look like you, or rather, I look like the you I turned into by being your imprint. You are exactly what is lost, since only you would fit the mold which I have become. Now, of course, the subject cannot sustain this identification which has turned me into a kind of graveyard of love. So, according to Freud, I begin to criticize myself for failing you or me. And in Freud's dread formula, I quote, the shadow of the object falls upon the ego. At this point, the work of grief begins to turn away from the identification of the subject. The work of grief now consists in the equally painful process of undoing the identification, of the unhitching, the, the unstitching stitch by stitch from the identification with the subject, the horrendously minutely detailed work of unpicking the subject from the object. It is in a way as if the object must die twice. First, at the moment of its own death, and secondly, through the subject's unhitching from its own identification. Indeed, traditionally, it is only then, it is only after the moment of this unhitching that, as it were, finally, the dead object the dead loved one can pass into a new register of existence, which is the register of memory. It's then that, that traditionally stones can be set. The cast represents not so much memory then 
as the moment before, this, this Rachel White reads practice of casting represents not so much memory, but represents the moment before, that of grief. And in a sense, its denial of memory in favor of the self-sacrifice which is contained in keeping the dead literally alive. It is clear in Freud's argument, and perhaps far from being a novelty, it drew a classical age to an end, that for that classical age, mourning and memorial are always necessarily a phase apart. Perhaps if my argument's right, and that the technique of Rachel Whiteread is, as it were, one that bears on mourning, perhaps it may be uh, the characteristic of the contemporary period that the traditional boundary, the traditional line, uh, which was always so clearly drawn um, between mourning um, and memory, between mourning and memorial, um, may be becoming kind of fatally blurred. And so now, as it were, the memorial, instead of being uh, the operation of memory, the invocation uh, to remember um, becomes, as it were, uh, part of the project um, to continue, uh, although continue in a kind of scattered way, um, the work of mourning. Uh, these, in my own mind, are kind of completely unresolved questions, um, but ones that I wish to put before you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased that we now have, in fact, 40 minutes uh, for questions. So um, I think what we'll do is to bring the table out here uh, so that the speakers could sit at it uh, and, and then open up a process of question and discussion. Could we put the screen up? everybody or to someone in particular um, and I think there should be uh, a microphone which people can use from the audience so um, could, could I see if there are questions or yes here my name is Ian um, in the time of the Shamir government in Israel there was a curious thing policy that whenever in the occupied territories um, a Jew would be assassinated, they would build a settlement at that point. And those settlements were built actually around the, uh, a monument, a memorial for uh, the victim. Uh, in a way, uh, it was uh, as if this was like the mythology for the building of this settlement. And perpetuated some sort of feeling of victimization for a very uh, violent settlement sometimes. Uh, I would like to ask Andrew Benjamin if he sees uh, a difficulty in the political use of this memory in, in those terms in, in relation to your analysis before. About the, story, about the story you just told. Yes, I mean, this is maybe it's an analogy because, uh, as well, uh, every visitor that visits Israel uh, right now has to go through Yad Vashem, which is like um, 
a memorial city there uh, housing um, Holocaust uh, museums and monuments forests and um, in a way it's been used to excuse or, or to explain uh, behavior of the Israeli state All I'd say in response is, is the point I, I tried to cover this very quickly earlier by saying I think that, that here James Young's work is actually very instructive. One has to sort of take each memorial in terms of its specificity and also the role it's going to ta play in a political s context. The Holocaust memorials and museums in North America, and it's particularly in the uni United States, are going to play a different role than they do in Israel, than they do in Europe. And I have no desire at all to, to generalize about them. It seems to me that when we case of Germany and uh, Austria and Poland, there are specific issues that we could talk about that have to do with how it is that the, the Holocaust or the Shoah is then memorialized or whatever word one wants to use in those contexts, by whom, for whom. To generalize it, I, I just think plays into the hands, in my own personal opinion, of a politics that ends up identifying Jews with Israel. And as a Jew, I'm very reluctant to allow that to happen for a moment. So I am therefore would want to hold these things apart by being rigorous, and that is to insist on specificity. to say something to uh, pick up the th um, idea with the book and it was mentioned in um, Rebecca mentioned it that it's basically up to us what kind of a library we're putting into this library um, it keeps on being repeated that the um, Rachel Whitewood monument is a symbol for the Jews as a people of the book um, if you read the catalog uh, to the exhibition it is actually not what Rachel had in mind when she was um, doing this project. The idea was initiated for this project after she came from Berlin 
and uh, where she was going through the files and files of archives of the um, uh, National Socialists there who had replaced people with numbers and files. So um, the idea of the um, people of the book is perhaps not the only interpretation one might have here. kind of uh, sticky here, but I think that's how she's asking us to be. <laughs> that the things that she is framing are books, not files. And in fact, I saw a very interesting picture of the file of one of the places where there is a, uh, um, well, in I think one of the sites, uh, I don't know whether it's Auschwitz or in Poland, but there is a room with files which have been preserved. Um, and it's a very haunting picture in the, of that space with the table and the order with which this was all kept. Uh, but, th but this is not that, in the sense that, uh, you know, ultimately when we get to the precision of the object, uh, that it, it, is the, it becomes more like the idea of the book than what I hear, which I kind of welcome very much uh, from you, which is to do with a certain kind of uh, history which uh, does not symbolize in a, as a general category. That, that in fact it is one which is embedded in history in a, diff in a different way. <coughs> and so on the one hand it's not the, um, the files as would have been found in a particular site. And on the other hand it, it is not books but, but book uh, category. as. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think for myself, I mean, I, I agree with that. And, I mean, for myself, it also it relates to the question of casting. I mean, I was unable in the, in the Tate exhibition not to read uh, the untitled bit mm -hmm. as, in a sense, um, a preliminary experiment to see, you know, how would this be uh, for the, um, for, for the, the Vienna project. Uh, now, to me, uh, you know, the, 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 what was exhibited as untitled uh, in Liverpool worked extremely well, um, cast, in a sense, in, in the way in which she had always worked, um, which, which leaves me feeling extremely kind of uneasy uh, about the status uh, of the books as they are now. That is to say, you know, with, uh, as I've read, kind of fiberglass kind of pages, and as it were, uh, with the whole thing bolted, bolted in. I mean, you know, clearly this is a, uh, a conscious decision to transform uh, the practice of work, uh, uh, and, and, and seems to invite the interpretation that it is being done um, to to mark out a general space of, of kind of symbolism, mm -hmm. uh, which is precisely, I think, what, what the, the earlier practice managed so um, effectively to avoid. I'd just like to add a couple of other observations on this, um, this relationship between this book, um, sculpture, and the, and the book, um, the book of memory and for for in, in European um, Judaism, not just after the Holocaust, but throughout the history of Judaism, where which would, uh, which would function overtly and explicitly as substitute memorials for people who couldn't put ones in the ground and so on, um, and that there's some there's a there's so many there's so much overdetermination in the in the White Tree Library, which um, I think refers. Um, it cannot, uh, as, as, as it's described on the wall in the, in the Tate, um, it's described as this extraordinarily affirmative um, celebration of the book and therefore of the possibility of Jewish survival by means of that, um, which would be to efface, um, I think, all the other administrative archival references um, which this monument so chillingly evokes, but it also would seem to be face something a strand in Judaism itself, which no one really talks about in relationship to this, which is the the notion um, which I think is very pertinent here, which is the notion of the defaced book, 
Um, so what I see in this, in this room is not simply the library, the humanist library, not simply the, um, the, 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 the sacred book, um, and whatever has become of it, and not simply the um, bureaucratic archive, um, which is the counter book, um, but also the, the fate of the defaced book in Judaism, which, um, as some of you may know, was treated um, as more or less a dead body, so that a defaced book, I mean, these, are, these are books with the name of God in them, um, a, a, a damaged or fragmented or illegible book um, could not be used to use that would be effectively to commit idolatry uh, as if to resuscitate a corpse and, and to put it into into action nor could it be thrown out because that would be the desecration of the corpse. it had to be literally buried in these structured in the structure called a geniza which was adjacent to a synagogue and it would, it would literally be, be packed away and, and I, mean, I think this is also very pertinent to to what is happening here um, in, in this monument. I don't really have anything to say about tourism per se, um, except um, that it seems to me it's, it's a part of the, um, one, one can of course um, read the monument negatively as a capitulation to a sort of symbolic, overly symbolic, allegorical um, affirmation. Um, but it, it might also be the case that um, that, as a, that, that it, as, as a monument which looks monumental, um, it also overtly bears its own guilt vis-a-vis -vis the um, institutional um, forces which are supporting it. And, and as such, it, it has a certain courage. Is it on? Um, I wanted to pick up on Mark's point about um, uh, the inefficiency of perception or the reluctance of perception. And I think it, it's interesting that throughout the afternoon how difficult we found it to, um, if you like, get the language right. Um, it would be intriguing to hear how often the word book had been mentioned. Um, there are no books. Uh, the whole point of a cast is that you make something which is immediately imagistic um, and uh, pictorializes, but it, it, uh, it makes something that, in the instance of casting a book, uh, can't be opened, can't be read, um, uh, can't be entered. Um, I think that there's been, for me, I've, I, I felt that there's the, the afternoon has been haunted by a kind of um, technical inefficiency. I mean, a, co a collective problem that perhaps everybody here um, hasn't made too many things. Um, but I will give you a simple example because it's one that I think everyone has the experience of, which is that if you bake a cake or you bake a loaf, you can put it in a container. And when it comes out, you will get um, a mold of that container. And as a rule, you get a trace left in the container of the material that was once in there. You also get the top side, which is in a very interesting space, all of its own, the top of the cake, the top of the bread, which is the bit that is in contact with the hot air. Um, it seems to me that, that while people have been struck, I, I, f I feel as if we've been sort of struggling for some kind of notion of authenticity. And I suspect that's because there's a proposal hidden in Rachel's work of um, a kind of Protestant veracity. This comes from uh, two sources, I think. One is um, uh, plaster as this ever so ordinary, noble material, um, which has a kind of everyday dignity to it. And the other is the fact that plaster in contact with an object kisses that object. But it, it's incredibly important to understand, I think, that this is always secondary. 
That is why um, uh, in Middle England, when they build uh, buildings out of stone, which are in fact cast stone, there is some terrible misapprehension of the original building, of the original material. It's because there's a jump. Um, I think it's not true to say that Rachel's work has consistently been faithful to a set of objects. These objects have always been highly manipulated. I mean, when we say a cast of a tub, in fact, there's a block there. That block refers to something which in turn has been removed. So I, I, I feel that I want to sort of make a plea for people to be much more vigorous in the way they look and, the w and what it is that they think they may see. And in this case, um, a fellow sculptor and I had a, a conversation earlier in the afternoon where we were struggling to describe how this monument might be. And we suddenly went, ah, you mean the books are made of plaster. It's, we're not, in this instance, talking about the negative space. And I think all of these things add up to something very, very important. Um, I, I think Richard just really crystallized with incredible clarity something I've been trying to struggle with for the last hour myself about the uh, aspect of vantage point in this work because it seems to me that insofar as um, memorials are expected to work at all they we may expect that they work through identity or identification uh, with what is represented and to identify suggests a vantage point in relation to an object um, and we then somehow identified with that thing in that position even though we are um, as it were facing it. Now, it seems to me that there's, there's three kinds of, mo of, of memorial. Um, there's the laudatory or cele celebratory uh, monument. Um, there's the kind of monument w which deals with lamentation and mourning. And um, there's a third kind, um, which you might describe as expiatory or admonitory. And it's basically, as far as I can see, an, e an expression of shame. And its uh, typical motto is ni vida, never again. Um, now, the first kind in this case seems to be clearly uh, not, not a tissue. But it seems to me that some of the ambiguities, both to do with the technique and to do with it, its legibility, um, in this case, arise from the curious fact that we're dealing with um, a monument that is created for two communities, or by two, two communities, the Jewish community and the Gentile community. Now, for the Jewish community, this is a monument of mourning and, uh, and loss and grief. But for the Gentile community, it's an admonitory one. It uh, has a different function. And in a sense, it's an expression of shame. Now, it seems to me that um, these two um, sort of somehow complementary uh, or kind of, uh, you know, that they, they fit each other positions uh, can be related technically to the problems of reading it. Because as if, if you read the object as um, an inside out cast in the sense that um, the books, if they were there, would be, as it were, facing inwards towards the center of the object and thus the object is the cast of the space which was the library or archive. Um, that's one way. And another way is if, on the other hand, as Richard just said, we might see the books as literally made out of the plaster or whatever other material, then um, the, the, the situation of, of vantage points and, and uh, the object I is reversed. Um, now, the object has a, um, a door 